and the producer was real funny he was like yeah like if he if he got pulled behind that thing and like went in the back of it it'd be like fucking career suicide for me <laughs> and I was like yeah and I'd, pr I'd probably die as well so that'd be fucking fairly shit <laughs> This is The Release, I'm Jack Parker, and today I'm speaking to Kojak. Hello. How you doing? Very good, how are you? Good, very good. Um, really enjoying Phantom of the Afters. Thank you. Yeah, how have the last two weeks been? What's been going on? Mad, very intense, but uh, great. Yeah. yeah, it's been really fun, comparatively, I think, to some of the other releases. I don't know, I just feel a lot more like in it and very like present in it this mm. time around, yeah. which is great. When when the last album, uh, Towns Dead, came out, was yeah. that that was just like off the end of the pandemic, right? Was it still pandemic period? It was like June 2021. Okay. So, yeah, it was still very much like we weren't sure if we could tour. Couldn't really have a release party. We kind of like had a small one. Yeah. So I kind of was just like straight in making stuff because there wasn't really any promise that we could do a tour or anything even. And like, yeah. So a lot of the tunes have just been, it's it's been fairly like, I didn't really take a break from the last one. Yeah. So it's been kind of like fairly back to back, but yeah, that's what, I don't know. I like working, so it's grand. Yeah. Um, so how, does it feel different this time then, like knowing the tour's like about to happen, you can like roll into that. The release is kind of a bit different, I guess, to the last one. Yeah, it was like deadline wise, it was kind of crazy. Yeah. Cause we had like, everything just kind of came at once i don't know we were, like the deadline to kind of have all of the record like finished and the artwork and everything was like the end of july and then we got asked to go to australia with Lil Kerner. Mm -hmm. so that was like the beginning of the july going to be all the way into august so we had to like in a week turn around the kind of like artwork do the shoot and then we got no the way. photos back while i was on tour and then i was doing all the edits like I'd do the stage thing <laughs> get off probably like eight o'clock nine o'clock go back into the dressing room, like edit the images and stuff like that. Yeah. Then send them away. And then we kind of got them finished the minute we got back. And then I got home and like flew to Dublin, shot like the Cabra Drive video. Wow. Went to New York, shot the one with Wiki. So it was mental. And then the tour is like in two days. Hmm. So yeah, it's been very full on compared to like Towns Dead where it was like, yeah. I don't think we toured till November with that right, one okay. so it was like June all the way up to November it was kind of like just twiddling my thumbs like, yeah. well I mean making music but yeah, yeah. waiting for it all to happen mm. and the waiting to see the response I guess as well like live that's, yeah. that's quite a difference yeah because you don't really get that chance if you're not kind of playing the music live you know, yeah. to kind of see which ones are hitting and uh, how people react to it and everything and how much when, so when you were tweaking the artwork and making those final touches did you were you still like working with the the ideas of that on the fly or, or did you already have it there already? You just needed to make the adjustments and everything. Like, do you know what the artwork was gonna be at that point? I had like, I made up a mood board hmm. to give to like the special effects artist and Rich Gilligan who shot the cover. Hmm. And we we're going for kind of like an Igor-esque kind of FK twigs. Like I wanted like a, a headshot for sure, probably like a color background. So we had a color rama and everything. It was like a yellow one. Hmm but a lot of the shots came back black and white. Like half of the shoot was probably black and white, like on film and the other half was digital. Mm. So some of the black and white shots were beautiful and then some of the color ones were beautiful. So in order to kind of like make them all uniform, I like turned everything black and white and it like a screen print kind of pass on it to do all the colors and everything. So still like very much tweaking it mm. and then sent it on to this guy called Antoine C Punch. Okay. It's like, hanging designer yeah. needed all of the text and like the text for the back of the record and yeah. the rest of the design stuff but yeah it came Apart out that, beautifully thank you yeah, yeah i'm pumped with it yeah, yeah i really really like it I just keep looking at it yeah. which is maybe very self-involved but i don't know <laughs> i just fucking like the way it looks like if you can't enjoy it then like what's the point right <laughs> yeah um i mean a good place to start really is is jackie dandelion yeah. Like when, how how early did you have that idea? Is that it was that idea the beginning of the creation of the record, or like were there songs already? Like what what was the starting point? That came about. I was in LA um, in May last year, I think, and we got asked to do a support slot for Fontaine's DC, mm -hmm. and I just made a stupid TikTok saying that my favorite song was Jackie Dandelions because I love dandelions. 
Uh, this tune is obviously Jackie Down the Line, which yeah. is a fucking banger. Yeah, great tune. But yeah. that's where it's really, it was really fucking dumb. It didn't make any sense. <laughs> it was just like a stupid, like in joke. Mm -hmm. And then that name was kind of like, you know, it's not far from Kojak, like Jackie. So I was kind of like, okay, that's kind of cool character wise. Um, but I didn't really think much about it. It's just like back of the head kind of a thing. And then had probably like 20, 30 songs recorded whittle it down did like a really hard cut on it and there was just it's kind of, it kind of happens at the end like framing the record is always the last thing like okay you do track listing and and then you kind of think of like all right how do you kind of progress the narrative and so like having a character is like a nice way to progress a narrative it's a nice little like vehicle for that shit so that's kind of where the character came from really and that pieces it together like at that point because all the inter with the interludes and everything is that yeah. one of the last things that comes yeah, that's in the framing wow. of the record. Uh, and like track listing and how you kind of transition one feeling into another and, and kind of like, yeah. So like all, all the little interludes for the most part, except for maybe like Goodbye Jackie Dandelion, like the opening one, for the most part, they're just little phone recordings that I took just from living in London. Like yeah. whether that's like just chatting to people in the pub or there's a little old couple that like, to be knocking around Stoke Newington, they're like a <laughs> Greek couple. And yeah. she's like 80, he's like 80. And yeah, she's a legend. I see her on the benches sometimes, but she was like, this is my boyfriend. <laughs> like they're not married or And, and yeah. uh, so I do be chatting to them a bit. And so like they're on the end of, I think, uh, Wagyu. Is this where they tell you to she's find like, someone and treat them right? Yeah, she's like, like, if you find a girl, make sure she's a nice one. <laughs> treat you good. For good for your family. And I was like, okay. How many like voice notes have you ended up with? Like so that? fucking many voice notes really? on my phone. Like they're not going to be used, but like I've got hundreds of voice notes on my phone. Yeah. Um, of just weird, interesting people that you meet around yeah. London and shit. But you know, sometimes they make it into a song, and other times they don't. It's just for my own enjoyment. Yeah, there must be like it must be so useful going back over all of those at the end of the project and just being like, I've just got this like library of interludes and stuff that I could put in. And, yeah, and, and they're like, they're a really nice way to frame different periods in your life as well. You kind of, sometimes little recordings that you don't even remember making, you'll go back yeah. and you'll be like, oh shit, yeah, I remember that day. Yeah. Or like little recordings of demos and stuff. Like it's really nice to go back and listen to them and then compare them to like the, the finished piece and shit. Yeah. So. It's like a form of documentary making in a way. But yeah, the iPhone microphone is amazing. Like I've used it before to record pianos and stuff that have ended up on albums. And really? Yeah, because it'll just be like demo shit and you'll have the idea and maybe you're just somewhere where a real nice piano but you don't have like music equipment which are like recording equipment. Mm -hmm. Just put the iPhone out, like you can put it in a sock if you want and that kind of helps dampen it a bit. But um, yeah, iPhone recordings have made their way onto my albums for a long time. Oh, wow, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have guessed that at all. That's That's crazy. In terms of the the themes on this record it seems like a lot of it is about move the move to london that you made which was mm. back in the in the pandemic time right um how much do you think that affected not just the the lyrical content and the and the themes of the record but like the sound and what, what's london kind of changed for you when making music i think it's kind of like um your environment is always going to affect how you write and, and what like how you express yourself and stuff and like the first half of the record kind of feels very much like you arrive in a new place you've got a lot to prove and mm. it's kind of like um trying to f find your feet in a new location and also kind of dealing with the, the ignorance that you kind of come across a lot because there is a lot of that you know our mm. histories are very different and we're taught a very different history than anybody in England is or anyone in Britain and so like you come at loggerheads with a lot of people because of that and then the kind of second half of the record is a bit more introspective I think and uh, I think there's a kind of certain mass that kind of lifts off at that stage and Covent Gardens and F Fat Ronaldo Covent Gardens is kind of like the turning point in the record in my yeah in my opinion anyway when I kind of like bravado lifts off in a big way mm. and it's kind of a, a bit more open i suppose um, yeah. and a lot less to prove and just kind of more yeah contemplative basically yeah you mentioned fat ronaldo larry bird yeah johnny mcenroe yeah 
why why what's like <laughs> leading you towards these sportsmen is there like a thread that we've missed or like <laughs> no, it's no thread it's no there's no thinking behind them it's i just like the names and how yeah. they look like yeah. aesthetically <laughs> who's like what like who's who's the number one like out of those three sportsmen like I don't know. Larry Bird could talk some good shit. Yeah. I, Larry Bird before the growth spurt. I'd love to put that on a t-shirt. Yeah. So that'd be good. That's fucking great. Johnny McEnroe. My ma is convinced that we're related to him because her second name is McEnroe. <laughs> she <laughs> always, like, every time I, every, anytime Johnny McEnroe's mentioned at all, she's like, we're related to him. And she'll go back in the family tree and I just think it's bullshit because she's kind of, I don't know, she's very into genealogy though. Right, and okay. like, knows it's like a country thing you yeah. know but knows who everyone is related to and how well that's maybe a Calvin thing too which is like yeah but uh so johnny mcenroe is probably a big contender too but fat ronaldo though he was unbelievable unbelievable yeah the haircut as, as well it was an iconic era yeah yeah especially with the haircut and shit but johnny mcenroe he's a, he, like he produces music as well no way yeah does he actually yeah, he plays guitar. Um, what kind of music? I I'm, I'm not sure. I've just heard stories about. Um, there's a story that uh, that Liam Gallagher was, te or maybe it was Noel, but um, one of the Gallagher brothers was saying they met him backstage at a show, and he picked up the guitar and just started doing a song about uh, you cannot be serious and all stuff like that. Shut it's, the fuck up. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. That is wild. Yeah. So <laughs> get the family ties out. Make yeah. a record. Yeah. Shit. Okay. Johnny McEnroe, have to get him the feature then. I'll reach out, <laughs> my long lost cousin. Yeah, yeah. So how how did the making of this record compare to, uh, I mean, in particular, Towns Dead and, and Deadly Daydreams? Like what what was different about this one? If or what you know what was the same? How do you kind of reflect on those those albums when when creating? Yeah, um, I. <clears throat> I don't know exactly what was uh, hard to say what's different I suppose but it's kind of like I think a big focus or like a big touchstone in my head was just being concise yeah. um, and I think just with the experience of having done two records already it's it's kind of like yeah you have less to prove even from a producer standpoint because I, I still do a lot of the production myself and I was working a lot with Karma Kid and a couple mm. different other heads but um, yeah yeah a big part of it was just being concise and not having to put all the bells and whistles on production. Um, just I suppose because you're a little bit more confident with like how it sounds. So if if the song only needs a sample and a kick and a yeah. snare or something like that, like it's all right if it's just that. And yeah. then the vocal will do the rest of the work. So that was a, I think that was a big one. And also like, keeping the time of the record the runtime down like i really wanted to get it like 45 minutes yeah and i think it comes in at like 46 so you know job done yeah. it's not too bad over a minute but that's grand how come that sweet spot what's what's the thinking behind that that's kind of like my attention span i think <laughs> okay. uh you yeah. know and also just kind of like if you can if you've got something to say and you can say it in that concise amount of time i think you're kind of yeah you've trimmed all the fat off basically yeah. so that's that was my thinking with it um, make it short make it sweet and just like hard cut only the best music you can do like no filler mm -hmm. that sort of thing no skips yeah, brilliant record there's definitely no filler on it and it feels like like every song has its moment on it as well nothing kind of bleeds into another and kind of gets missed when you're listening to it I mean we've had it on repeat even just all day today but it's been on repeat since it's since it's come out um, and then also with all the with all the you know interludes and with with all the the things that you can kind of dig into and hear it over repeat listens you know it's quite a rewarding album you know as previous ones have been as well do you find yourself um yeah constantly trying to search to find things to put throughout the record to kind of keep people interested and keep people like getting things on on repeat listens I, like what I really like with albums is when they feel like a little world yeah. and they're kind of self-contained and you can really like escape into it but yeah like any record that I really love like Currents or uh, like The Party Andy Shelf Igor there's tons of them um, that have their own character and their own kind of uh, not neuroses that's not the word, idiosyncrasies mm -hmm. like little little parts that 
they're not they're not really it's not songwriting exactly like let's say like the interludes or the little things that kind of move you from one track to another they're like the makeup of the world of the album if yeah. that makes sense and it's for repeat lis- listens because i still really love the album as like an art form and um i yeah i think it's fucking banging like working towards something that's like a bigger piece like nearly like how you write a novel as opposed to just mm. focusing on singles and that sort of thing yeah because i've just never really i don't know i'm not really a single artist i don't think if that makes sense mm. like i much prefer working on bigger bodies of work and stuff that is rewarding on repeat listens like so that's where a lot of that stuff comes from and as well as that it was kind of like this time around we were very it was like fairly strict anything that went in it was like what is the purpose of this and there was interludes that i took off and mm. and and different ones that um didn't make it for that exact reason it was kind of like have you said this already in any part of the record mm. does it need it here is silence okay like so yeah that's kind of a big component uh, behind the decisions of like yeah that sort of stuff it's so satisfying to like have so much to kind of dig into and it does feel like every record is a different world to live in you know while you're you're doing it what, what have been your have you got like a favorite character or interlude from your own discography that, that you particularly like love i personally love and braggadocio yeah where it's like my favorite insult in a song where you say hey chinos to the guy yeah yeah on the end of that record it's just like makes me smile every single time <laughs> thank you uh i really like the fella that we interlude uh, well uh, the interlude at the beginning of Cabra Drive there was another part of that that didn't really make the cut like that whole voice note is fucking gold your man it's like they fucking hate me in here it's like I'm always smoking weed out the back but the class man I'll just say it's the people next door it's like all I can fucking do I can drink Guinness I smoke weed it's all I can fucking do mate and he went on for about 10-15 minutes like he was I was fucking busting my whole laugh, and he was so. Were you so recording funny. the whole the whole thing? Yeah, because he was just a fucking mad character, you know <laughs> what I mean? Um, and he just got chatting to us because he asked us what he what we roll him a joint because he was about ten points deep, like at that stage. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> so he's probably my favorite, but like the little Guinness interlude I might use on a different thing. But yeah, <laughs> he was fucking funny. There's a couple others that I like. I like the old couple from the end of um, Wagyu. Yeah. Those are the ones I kind of so like. So the guy in in the in the pub is he the guy who's talking about the chuckle brothers? Is that him? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You say chuckle brothers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Trying to start the conversation about anything he's overheard in the pub. That kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. literally like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're going back to my childhood. <laughs> yeah. And Hack is like so. Hack Baker's on it as yeah. well. That's right. So he's the one who's in the Nelson. Yeah. Which I didn't realize. I didn't know that. But Marcus. Oh, behind the camera mentioned earlier yeah mm. I didn't, that's that's amazing yeah hack baker is like you know in terms of the fabric of like east london he's real like yeah. just as legit as they come um so i was doing a session with him and we were working on some stuff and at the end of it i was playing him some of the record and he was playing me some of his stuff um that came out on world it's world's end fm mm. and karma kid who executive produced this record we, he was the same on Hack Baker. He executive mm. produced Worlds Worlds End FM, so we kind of had to link up that way. And then at the end of the session, I was like, "I've got an idea for like an interlude. Mm. It's like you calling me, trying to get me out. I'd love you to do it." And it was at the beginning of "What If" to begin with, but I changed it over to um, Citizen Kane and then put the weird BBC interlude at the beginning of what if instead but he nailed it like he and he <laughs> yeah it, it's kind of like a hard one to ask someone especially because you know like i i want i wanted that voice like you know like his fucking proper authentic like east london accent yeah. um because it's part of like the story of the record is you know moving a location like going somewhere very different and you know being at the fucking afters every other week so like yeah, having him on it was brilliant and he, he smashed it. Like, I think it only took us about four or five tries before we had one. And he was just kind of ad libbing. I, I gave him some script ideas, but yeah, he just kind of ad libbed it and smashed it. Yeah, he's fucking amazing. amazing. I love his music. He's incredible. So, you've been living in London for about three years now, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. How have you found 
your time here you know do you feel like it was the right move for you when you made it yeah i mean i really enjoy my time here basically and yeah i mean it's expensive but it's really not that much more expensive than dublin mm. um which says a lot for the housing crisis in dublin mm. which is it's just mad i don't know um i found it extremely difficult to find a place to live while i was there and uh yeah uh, some opportunities just kind of fell into my lap in terms of housing here so that was kind of a big component to the move but then a lot of my friends ended up emigrating as well so there's like a big irish enclave of us over here that i kind of hang out with um i really enjoy it i think there's like like another positive about it i suppose is there's a lot more people who are kind of working full-time in music mm. so it kind of spurs you on in that sense because it seems more achievable and as well as that like you know there's people that take it very seriously and so they'll spur you on as well like so yeah i like it was it a difficult decision to make that in terms of of leaving is it difficult to leave london behind uh, sorry dublin behind for london like in many ways because i guess it's it, there's there's a some people find it as a sort of a, like a, it's the acceptance to go and take your music to the UK rather than like stay in Dublin. Do people kind of feel pressured to like stay and make the scene stronger there or do um, come into it much? There's the, like, you know, fairly well reinforced um, uh, chips on people's shoulders for people that move to England and stuff. Like mm. that's where taking the soup comes from. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, yeah but i don't know like from my perspective like you might not always be able to go but you can always come back like that's kind of how i'm i look at it anyway um so i'm young like it's it's it makes sense to go out and explore different parts of the world there's just you know just like it makes sense that people are kind of um tetchy when people leave because so many mm. people do like and there's also a sense of there's a lot of issues in in dublin um and so I think it can feel for people like they're getting deserted yeah. in like a shit situation. Mm. Like the best part about Dublin is the people for yeah. sure, you know? Um, so I think people just get upset when, when those people leave, like as you would. Um, but yeah, you can always come back like. Yeah. In terms of your interest in, in filmmaking and, and music videos and the music videos around this uh, album, what was the what was the most fun to make? What was the most interesting that you made? I mean, Cabra Drive seemed like a lot of fun. Yeah, Cabra and Drive was great. Were you wearing cheek prosthetics as well? Yeah, yeah. it was like, what do we have? Latex eyebrow, got rid of all <laughs> the eyebrow, like hairs or whatever, fake cheeks, little bump on the nose, fake lip, push the ears forward. Yeah. It takes about two and a half hours to do. It's Saeed Nguir, um and her assistant Dano did it. Um, yeah, she's an amazing SFX artist. I really wanted to work with her for ages. So I'd done some work with her previously on like a video that I directed for Keen Cabinet, uh, Street Lights, where she like made him look like a werewolf and it was banging. So I wanted to work with her from that. Yeah, like Cabra Drive was a lot of fun, but I was completely exhausted at that stage. Like really, really, because I'd only got back from Australia a day I think and then I flew back to Dublin mm. so I was fairly exhausted but it was fun because I was working with um, Connor Bradley who was like an up and coming director from Ireland yeah. um, and it was fun to kind of see like a younger blood in it you know and like all the crew were, were buzzing so that was sick but I'd say Bambi I think was probably my favourite one to yeah. shoot it was fairly stressful but like uh, getting to work with Sam Agar again was just like dream come true because like a door working with him yeah. done a lot of collaboration with him in the past um, and there was a lot of problem solving we had to do when it got to actually filming on a fucking ice rink <laughs> but uh, yeah that how, one I think was my favourite how was it set up so that you could where was the camera like what did you did you have to build something so you had something over the top of you or it was because were just, you pulled across actually <clears throat> by the machine no oh okay no because essentially those Zamboni machines are like massive lawnmowers yeah that cut ice yeah with a quite uh, <laughs> like the gap underneath the back of one of those machines is large enough that you could just slide right under it um, so yeah. yeah and I remember talking to the producer about it on the day and like or when we went for like a location scout and we were looking at the machine and it's it's about 10 or 12 foot tall as well like it's massive yeah 
like a huge ride on lawnmower and uh, I was like there's no way you're pulling me behind that like I know it's my idea but like <laughs> I'm not fucking going behind that thing and the producer was real funny he was like yeah like if he if he got pulled behind that thing and I like, went in the back of it it'd be like fucking career suicide for me <laughs> and I was like yeah and I'd, pr- I'd probably die as well so that'd be fucking fairly shit but um, we ended up just dragging me behind a on a dolly like yeah. um, with rubber rubber wheels on it and it worked actually fairly well and I was just kind of had my legs like around the tripod and yeah. I had a skateboard with no trucks underneath me basically that was how we kind of slid along um, yeah so that was how we did that one but yeah there was a couple of things with like we didn't realise how old it was in Guildford it was Guildford oh, yeah. Spectrum yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know if you've ever been there yeah 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 all the time growing up wild place yeah it's an ice rink and a swimming pool yeah and a bowling alley yeah and there's like a burrito place in it as well it's great it's a great place a, to a lot out. of other sports if you're like 11 to 14 that's that's where you go for the yep. weekend yeah well you should go in quick because it's getting torn down oh is it yeah <sighs> RIP shame. to a real one yeah poor old Guildford Spectrum yeah it was great but the lights in there were really old so they took about 10 minutes to turn on and off <laughs> which was yeah. crazy yeah. and really fucked us for like some of the ideas for lighting yeah so we kind of just had to play it by ear with that but yeah there's loads of sick people I got to work with on that like Angela Mulhern was on there um, did all the art direction and Owen McLaughlin was shooting it and yeah it was brilliant yeah I, I really liked that one yeah it sounds amazing um and then you obviously collaborated with a lot of people um on the tracks of the album as well um including big pig and uh um, and wiki as well um yeah so in uh, in terms of those collab uh, collaborations on the on the album with the artists that you've worked with i mean how did they come about is there anyone you specifically wanted to work with going into the making the record um, yeah, Woof, I had the hook and my verse all done and recorded and like the back end of the song. But there was space for a verse on it, so I sent it to Jess and then she didn't get back to me for like four days. J- j- yeah, she tends not to text back anyway. <laughs> uh, but I was kind of like, well, she didn't like it. That's kind of it. Wrote that one off. Was thinking of like other people. And then she got back and was like, I love it. Um, let's just find time to get in the studio. So we managed to thank fuck and yeah she wrote her verse there and it was fucking unbelievable and then wiki um i had a different tune i was hoping to get him on wagyu actually um and i'd reached out but i hadn't heard any word back and then when i was in new york last may for the tour um i was doing a session with tony seltzer and my manager last Mm. minute texted me and it was like wiki's gonna come to the session i was like fucking unbelievable because <laughs> I like, adore his music you know and that Half God record was like incredible like one of my most listens to that year for sure yeah. and so I was listening to that on the way to the studio and he fucking like came out of the studio doors right when I arrived and like had him in my ears and pulled it off he's like hey yo Kojak right and I was like yeah it's fucking mad <laughs> it was very bizarre it was like 4D like the music came out of the fucking headphones <laughs> and was talking to me on the street so that was sick but uh, yeah we were up making tunes made about three or four and then moved on to the Johnny McEnroe one and I it was a Leon Ware sample which I didn't realise how big Leon Ware was he fucking wrote for Michael Jackson and Marvin Gaye and right, stuff okay. and like I just found it on a YouTube channel with like t- a thousand views and I was like grand this obscure artist this will be easy to clear <laughs> it's fucking pain in my arse to clear <laughs> but um yeah so I sent the sample over to Tony and he made the beat and then I wrote my verse recorded it and Wiki was like rolling joints smoking on his phone and I was like you know like an hour passed and I was like fuck he's (laughs) he's not feeling this like this isn't gonna get cut and then he fucking got in the booth and rapped for like four minutes straight like we had to cut his verse in half it was so long like so um, just to make sense with the strong structure so that was fucking amazing. That was like a really surreal moment. Um, yeah, I really fuck with him. He's a sick dude. That's amazing. Are there any other artists that, you know, like him that you would really like on your bucket list to to work with? Charlotte Dos Santos was a massive one. Yeah. So I absolutely adore like uh, Cleo, her first album is incredible. Like Good Sign and Red Clay. And she's on What If, right? Yeah. The, the What If tune was like, yeah. I had all the verses done and there was just space in it naturally for like a, a hook 
and my manager reached out to Charlotte Dos Santos and she sent her vocals back and they were like unbelievable from the mm. get go so she was sick to work with as well she was like yeah really easy to collaborate with and really open to different ideas and stuff so yeah that was amazing how do you normally go um, sample hunting like what's the yeah well, how, how do you find where, where's like the strangest thing place you found like something you've ended up mm, using a TikTok I think it's right, probably okay. the weirdest place like yeah. Sammy Copley I got from TikTok okay oh yeah yeah, yeah. Well, at the end of the record right? yeah heaven shouldn't have you so friend of mine sent on um, sent on his tune and then I downloaded it like did all the reversing and stuff and yeah there was something about like that vocal and the little recording of the demo that just felt like archaic it felt like an old mm. Irish ballad you know um, we were literally saying that actually before you turn up yeah talking about that. so I remember showing it to Karma Kid in a big batch of different tunes and it was just one I made for myself I didn't really like intend for it to be on any record because it's quite different really than like a lot of my other stuff um, and he was just like what the fuck is this and like especially with the tune at the end she's like where did you find that is that this like from the 60s or something and I was like mm. it's from TikTok actually yeah. so <laughs> the most opposite of the 60s um, very very modern and then I reached out to Sammy and yeah they were just like fucking buzzed um, mm. so yeah I was really glad we could get that sample this all sorted and beautiful like, ending to the to the album because it's such a uh in like a really vulnerable raw song and then that yeah that outro is like stunning like. yeah and I think like um, it just sums up a lot of the themes of the record like particularly with emigration and mm. the kind of love-hate relationship with Ireland um, sounds really reflective as well yeah totally and yeah. even that recording like that's again like that's an iPhone recording like a video you know yeah um, wow. I didn't do much to it bar like a bit of EQing I think yeah and just like getting rid of some of the harsh frequencies but apart from that it's just like sometimes that's the beautiful thing about recording you'll just capture like a beautiful moment like that even if it's like on your phone or whatever hmm. um, and it's something that I like it's the bane of my existence often it's like demo-itis mm -hmm. like I had that really bad with Phantom of the Afters because I recorded the vocal originally like after I was on a stag do for a whole weekend right. and my voice was fucked it was like so <laughs> gravelly and like in bits sounded amazing but it was like I recorded it in a conservatory which is like the worst place you can ever record <laughs> something and then I wrote the second verse and was like tried to record the vocal the same way and it sounded nothing alike yeah. so it took about four months to get the vocal right for that one because wow. I had to wait until I was on the piss again for like <laughs> you know three days in a row and then my voice was sufficiently fucked yeah how long did the, the, the whole concise thing creation of the record then from start like start to finish how, what kind of time frame was it I started writing it like you know the minute I handed in the masters for the last record so that would have been like December time I think 2021 maybe uh, or maybe January so about three years yeah. well two two years and then it like all came together really since last August mm -hmm. that was really when it was like okay we're gonna like make the new record we're gonna have to cut some songs and figure out what it is and get them all finished so that final straight when you're <clears throat> wrapping it up is that like do you enjoy the intensity of that and the decision making and everything that goes into those like or is that kind of like does it become a little bit of like a labor of love or do you um, like those decisions no I don't enjoy it uh, yeah no, and it was really hard this time because I was really badly depressed like while I was trying to fin finish the record off so in terms of decision making it was like trying to battle with creative decisions as well as like really bad anxiety you know mm. so it, and it really clouds like decisions like that and as well as that you've been listening to the songs probably for about six eight months yeah um, before you even go to mix it and then once you're mixing it like you're listening to it in such fine detail that it's like you really can't see the wood from the trees how do you deal with going like stepping away from that and that and still kind of being able to stay attached to it well, what, what do you do i think like um a root having a routine generally is like a good way of having some control on your life and situations like that particularly like if you're in like a depressive episode i don't know i could trying to remember that it's not the fucking be all and end all hmm. and you'll make more work 
and it's it's just art it's what you do it's not who you are you know what i mean mm. that's a good one as well i've got like a a really good team of people around me so they're really good in terms of like knowing when to push me a little harder and knowing when to just kind of like back off and mm. you know let me take a break and shit so is there anything before like we go back into it is there anything i haven't discussed yet that you want kind of wanted to talk about um people should know about the record that they might not pick up on or um i'm not sure i mean I, f I feel like we've we've discussed like a lot of the record when i was kind of summing it up i was trying to like yeah i i met with una malali and did like a an interview um when the album was mixed to kind of discuss it and she was writing the biog mm. and it was actually really useful because i talked through it and at that stage uh, the album was called something else it was, uh, I was gonna go with like Superism I think okay. to begin with or like something soup themed anyway <laughs> um, and it just I came away from the conversation just feeling like the album wasn't actually done you know mm. um, and I couldn't really put my finger on it but I changed some stuff in the track listing and then obviously I went through and listened to it again and Phantom of the Afters kind of stood out to me as like summing up the themes of the record the best mm -hmm. and also it's a less cryptic name you know so I think that was helpful but after the conversation I was kind of I don't know I kind of just tried to break down what the record was really about and I think for the most part it's like the album is kind of about love and it's about ambition and I think like those two ideas can kind of come at loggerheads sometimes because mm. they both require like commitment and as well as that like they're kind of opposing themes in a certain sense because love is like accepting things for what they are and then ambition is wanting more than what you have mm. and if you get like too lost in one you get blinded to the other you know what I mean so it's like yeah you don't see what's actually in front of you and you're kind of you're like a fucking ghost basically mm. you're like living in this fantasy of what you think your life should be so that was kind of what the record really culminated in, I think, or a lot of the themes anyway. Yeah, feeling a bit disillusioned, I think, with stuff and yeah. um, frustrated. And that a lot of that just comes from not um, looking at what you actually have, yeah. basically. Yeah, I was going to, I mean, you answered it perfectly already. I was going to ask you about uh, love and ambition and what you wrote in the, in the, for the vinyl that yeah. people can buy now if you would like yeah people certainly can buy the vinyl <laughs> and if you don't want to buy that you can definitely buy the download or yeah. a cassette maybe give it to your granny all available yeah. is there, can you get a badge are there any badges anywhere i want to uh make them available but i think i'm just gonna have them for the live shows yeah you know hand them out to the to the lovely patrons of the live shows yeah and you can also buy a ticket to the live show <laughs> Um, Good to get the plug in somewhere. Yeah, right? exactly. It was so natural. <laughs> in in preparation for this, I was I was like trawling through um, YouTube and I came across your tour diary in 2019. Yeah, yeah. When uh, you were out on the road and you went, so that must be what the first UK tour you did, yeah, right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. First um, or second one, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it was 2019. Yeah, May 2019. I think that one was a. Uh, the first time I saw you play was. Um, you played a Fred Perry show at the Hundred Club. Yeah. Was that well, was that before? Or, that must have been around the same time, right? Yeah, just I think Delhi Daydreams had just come out. Yeah. It was maybe before that tour. Puma Blue was playing there. Yeah. Um. Couple, Sk Skinny couple Pooh Lembe was he on the lineup? I think so. Dem Denzel himself, I think yes. as well. A couple yeah. others. Um. Sons yeah. of Raphael. Do you remember? Yeah. Them? They were on the lineup. That was a good lineup. Yeah, it really was. I love Puma Blue stuff. Um, mm. Cam, who plays bass with him, he did a session kind of bass set for me. We did like a live breakdown thing for Majestic Casual. He's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so I was watching the the tour from 2019. How do you reflect on that that time now? You know, you're about to go obviously on a, another big, well, European tour. Um, what was it like looking back to like 2019, like first trip around the UK hitting up all these places like was it Leeds and was it Leeds or no it was Sheffield and yeah live at Leeds I think was the festival in Sheffield to about eight people I think uh, yeah we just came out and asked everyone their names it was so few <laughs> people at the show yeah um, 
Yeah, and then you juxtapose that with like the London show, which is so loud. Yeah. Like, and it was it was sick. I I love those videos. You know, I'd love to make another one like it. And um, we had Charlie Doran travel around with us. It was great. He just, I think he just he was a real good addition to the crew, and he kind of captured our personality very well. Yeah. But it's cool to look back at that stuff because it was all, you know, it was all independent back then. It's yeah. independent now still. And people just came out because they loved the music. Hmm. And even with the shows where people don't show up or, you know, if it's 10 people in a room, it, like, I think a lot of people look out and, like, see the empty space. And some people actually, which I think is, like, the worst behavior ever, like, you come out to a show and you see that it's not that lively or, like, there's not that much people and you punish the ones that do come <laughs> for that, like, for the ones that aren't there. Yeah. Like, you're mental. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, when you get, like, shows like that and it's, like, a small amount of people or whatever, the people that are there like, really want to see the music, you know, and they're, like, yeah. really fucking fans because it's not like it's a popular thing in the town or whatever. So you put the show on for the people that are there, not the ones that aren't. So, yeah. Yeah, I I have yeah I I just like to perform anyway so like yeah yeah it's fun I love that video those little vlog things yeah it's, it's really them. it's really cool to uh, to look back on yeah on that um, from an outside perspective obviously um, what can people expect from the live shows coming up a lot of theatrics I think okay. I mean it's a night at the opera yeah so yeah it's theatrics we're going uh, we're going all out it's going to yeah. be a big show I'm pumped for it. Yeah. a lot of stuff that I think yeah I just love live performance you can do a lot that you just can't achieve on a record if that makes sense it comes across in a very different way so yeah yeah. you gotta buy a ticket to see though buy a ticket yeah. it's gonna come out about halfway through the tour so <laughs> if you're in Europe <laughs> yeah you I'm in Europe <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, cool and like what else can we expect moving forward like what, what what's happening in 2024 I still, I, there's a couple of songs off the record that I still want to make videos for. Mm -hmm. So, might do that. And then, you know, just new music. Moving on to new stuff once this one's had a, a bit of time to breathe, I think. Are you in the same mindset that you kind of want to move on to the next the next album like you did from Towns Dead to, to this one? I'm not as anxious to do that on this time around. I'm just really enjoying, like, the rollout of this record. Yeah. just being more present in it for what it is now which is like the release and sharing it with people so I'm not that anxious to make new stuff uh, at the minute but the live performance usually kind of spurs me on mm -hmm. so I'd say there'll be a little vault or yeah well of inspiration from, from the live stuff amazing say. sounds great uh, is there anything else you want to add or anything this feels like a good place to wrap up don't think so okay yeah All it was right. just a nice chat thanks for having me thanks for joining us Cheers. Cool. Cool. Lovely, dude. Hope that was all right. Nice. Yeah. I haven't been talking for too long. Sweet. Lovely. Sweet as. Oh.